Good afternoon, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins 30-minute COVID-19 briefing, where we provide live insights from the experts who lead our work at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. For the next half hour, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic and public health responses. As a reminder, in 2022, we will continue offering these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm part of the leadership team for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. We'll be providing answers in real time today, so please submit your questions in the box at the bottom of your screen. Today, I'm joined by three guests. First, Beth Blauer, who is Associate Vice Provost for Public Sector Innovation at Johns Hopkins, and she's the data lead for the Coronavirus Resource Center. Beth is going to talk about trends we're seeing in the COVID-19 data. Then we'll hear from Dr. Jennifer Nelzo, who is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Jennifer will give an update about trends we're seeing and the latest news on disease spread. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Bill Moss, who's the executive director of the Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Bill will give an update about COVID-19 vaccines. I'm now going to turn to each of our three speakers for a brief overview. Beth, first to you. Given the rapid rise in cases that we've seen during the Omicron-driven surge, have states been able to keep up with their COVID data reporting? Thanks, Lainey. Yeah, it's a great question. So we've seen, obviously, a tremendous growth in case data uh, over the course um, of Omicron coming into uh, the United States, especially, and overtaking the Delta variant. Um, a couple things to know about um, the data. One thing um, I think most specifically is that we saw leading into this period of time, uh, states that were really kind of pulling back on their data uh, and their data sharing. So we saw many states stop reporting over weekends, um, some states moving to uh, weekly reports or biweekly reports. Um, and what we did find is that with the surge of all of this new case data, uh, the rise of Omicron, um, we didn't see states at the same rate building back in that data data reporting. So states are continuing to sort of pull back on their regular reporting, which will have long-term effects on our ability to track trends around the spread of, um, of COVID. And so um, while we uh, encourage everyone to continue to report, that is another significant impediment. The other big trend in the data that we've been looking at very closely here at the CRC is around the proliferation and use of antigen testing. Um, up until now, we've been tracking antigen testing that's been reported through local health departments. That antigen testing is largely um, facility-based testing. So testing that's taking place in places like congregate care facilities, um, facilities that um, have been using rapid tests for workforce reasons or um, large institutional settings like colleges and universities. Um, what we're not capturing is at-home testing. And at-home testing is now now probably one of the most important tools um, that we have for um, really understanding um, whether or not we personally have uh, COVID and if we're going to engage in some of those key public health mitigation strategies. Uh, but on the data side, the complexity is that um, we're not getting that information to local health departments, and those samples are not collected in a way uh, where further sequencing can happen. Um, and so as we talk about trends um, in disease spread, we have to understand that the case data that we're seeing now um, is largely still being driven by PCR testing. Um, and as we see more and more antigen testing coming in, that diminishes um, our, our use of case data to understand the full spectrum uh, or impact that COVID is having in communities. So as you see, even these very sharp increases in the data, um, we're probably still undercounting those cases because of the fact that we know a lot of people are using antigen testing to confirm their disease. Um, lastly, I think most importantly is the trends. There is some good news this week um, where we're seeing a particularly in the Northeast, in the Eastern region of the United States, um, a real recession of that data. So the data is moving um, in the right direction. We're seeing case data really plummeting um, as fast as we saw this 
big surge of cases. We're seeing the same kind of speed as we're seeing uh, Omicron leave um, uh, the regions. Um, hospitalizations are also starting to turn that corner. Um, and we're still seeing increases in deaths, but we're hoping that that continues to slow. Um, the Northwest is still where we're seeing the uptick in cases. Um, we're continuously kind of monitoring it. And I know that um, uh, that Dr. Nuzo is going to take us through some more of that trend analysis. But all things um, seem to be um, really sort of trending in the right direction. Um, but again, we are, it is complicated by the flow of that data. Thanks so much, Beth. And that is your ending remarks are a perfect segue into my question for Jennifer. So Jennifer, throughout the United States, folks are starting to suggest that we might be just past the peak of the latest surge. Do you feel like that sentiment is accurate? And can you put it into a global context? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, as Beth said, we are seeing evidence um, that the national numbers have peaked in the sense that we have seen now declines that have been um, sustained consistently for, for um, more than two weeks. And that's we always looked for at least two weeks to to declare um, a, a nascent trend. Um, but I have to stress because I think we are so eager for good news uh, for sure. But, um, you know, what we are still seeing is uh, historically uh, really, you know, unprecedented levels of cases. So, um, you know, while uh, this the trend is, is headed in the right direction nationally, um, there's still an extraordinarily amount of cases, extraordinarily high number of cases that's being reported across the nation. So this week we saw more than 4 million cases reported, which was 22% lower than the uh, previous week. Great, great news. But if we compare it to this time last year, the case count was just over a million cases reported the same week last year. So just to put into context how much higher the case numbers are um, in this surge than what we've seen uh, prior. Now, um, we have some some good news in comparing to last year that I'll get to in a minute. But um, I also want to stress that this is a big country. And um, what we saw happen is that the, the most populous parts of the U.S. Um, got hit first with the Omicron um, surge. And they are now, as Beth said, um, um, starting to recede. That's going to have a, a big pull down on the national numbers. But it may mask um, other parts of the country that aren't quite as populous, but that are still reporting case increases. Um, so this week, we had uh, 28 states report record, record high case totals. And um, although, uh, you know, pretty much most states are seeing a slowing in the growth of their cases. Um, we still have a number of states uh, that have been reporting um, sustained increases. So we haven't peaked everywhere. And, um, you know, I think we should uh, have a note of caution when we try to, you know, compare the United States to what we've seen in, in other countries. I know a lot of people are sort of expecting Omicron to come and go really quickly based on the experience of other countries. We have to recognize the fact that we have different vaccination coverage, different levels of immunity, and also that we are so incredibly geographic diverse and our population just may not mix quite in the same way. So it, it could be a, a longer time to decline than what we have seen elsewhere. Um, as Beth mentioned, um, the death numbers are increasing and that's very much expected because deaths lag cases. So the deaths, the increase in deaths that we're seeing now is the result of those um, you know, really almost impossibly high case numbers um, that we saw um, several weeks ago. Now, um, I compared the case numbers that we're seeing this week to this time last year to show how much greater uh, the numbers are now than they were this time last year. Um, and while the death numbers are continuing to increase, what is some good news is that the proportion of cases that are resulting in death this time around is much lower than what we saw this time last year. Um, so uh, that is good and it's a testament to um, immunity, particularly from uh, vaccines, um, but it also you know, underscores the fact that anytime you have extraordinarily high numbers, even if the percentage of those cases that will result in death is low, it adds up when the numbers are, are really great. Um, I have to talk a little bit about hospitalizations. They are starting to decline, but again, not everywhere. Big country, it's going to take a while for those, those numbers to come down. Um, and then testing. Beth talked about testing, and this is going to be really the dominant issue, I think, going forward. Um, I remain absolutely worried about the fact that we have um, really record high test positivity still. Um, we're over 20% test positivity as a nation, and um, I always look at test positivity of as a measure of are we doing enough testing? And when I see test positivity 
that high? The answer is an astounding no. Um, what it means is that when we have test positivity that high, that we are missing a whole lot of, of infections that are um, not likely showing up at the facilities that are doing the tests that are getting captured into our surveillance system. We're probably testing the people who are the sickest and most likely to have COVID and not casting a wide enough net to try to find infections in people who may not have symptoms or otherwise look like obvious um, COVID cases. So testing is really, really important. And, and um, as Beth mentioned, uh, you know, we obviously have work to do in order to expand it. Giving people home tests is a great option, but it, there will be a cost. And in particular, the cost that I'm worried about is, is not capturing those infections for the purpose of tracking variants. That will be an, an important story um, going forward. It's great to give people tools in order to figure out if if they're infected so they can know whether it's safe to go to work or, or gather with friends or family, but it does come at a surveillance cost. And I think we have to um, you know, give some thought to how our national and you know, state and local case numbers may be shifting to re be reflective of a different population than they were when testing uh, was much more available um, you know, throughout the community and not necessarily limited to, to test done at home. Um, globally, similar trends uh, where um, we are still very much seeing the Omicron surge play out. Uh, a number of countries are still reporting increases. A number of countries are just starting their Omicron surge. Um, and so while the global numbers are starting to, to slow a little bit, you have to recognize that the United States, as the country that has, continues to report the most number of cases, has a big pull on, on the global numbers. Uh, so um, we shouldn't derive too much uh, complacency when we see the numbers start to come down, knowing that uh, many countries, their Omicron surge is really just getting started. And I think that really much wraps it up. Thanks, Jennifer. Before I turn to Bill, I do wanna remind our audience, please submit questions for our experts in the box that you see at the bottom of your screen. I do see lots of questions coming in and we will move to Q&A right after Bill's remarks. So Bill, there's been news this week about the potential for Omicron specific boosters. Can you talk us through these developments and also how they might impact the global vaccination effort? Yes, thank you, Lainey. And maybe I'll start with the global situation um, the, we've reached a milestone uh, just today with an estimated number of 10 billion vaccine doses administered uh, since vaccines became available just about 13 months ago. And I just want to highlight that this is such a remarkable achievement and that it's worth, I think, pausing and, and reflecting on that fact. There is, uh, in the history of vaccine administration, there have ne has never been as many uh, vaccine doses as administered in such a short period of time. And what makes this even more remarkable an achievement is that the first vaccine uh, doses actually were administered about one year after the first recognition of this novel coronavirus. So there is, has been remarkable uh, progress and achievement in getting 10 million doses administered. Now, if you think about it, given that there are approximately 8 billion people in the world, 10 billion doses should be enough to have gotten a single dose into everyone in the world with some extra. Um, but it turns out that fewer than just under two thirds of people have actually received a single dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. So that means obviously that one third of the world's population has yet to receive a single dose. And just underscoring again, Lainey, and I know we've talked about this over and over in these uh, sessions, you know, the, the global inequities in administering COVID-19 vaccines um, and the, the place where, where coverage is the lowest is uh, in the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, where only about 15% of the population has received at least one dose. Now, I'm optimistic that this will improve this coming year. Um, COVAX, the facility, uh, uh, the mechanism for getting vaccines into uh, low uh, and, and middle income countries um, has begun uh, to do better in being able to deliver vaccines. They recently announced that they have delivered their billionth dose of vaccines, but they had originally aimed for 2 billion doses by the end of 2021. I think the supply shortage uh, of vaccines will 
uh, uh, diminish uh, in this coming year, but we're still going to be faced with enormous challenges in getting those vaccines into people's arms, particularly in low-income countries, um, uh, combating misinformation and disinformation so that there's the demand for the vaccine, and being able to track who gets the vaccine and who does not. With regard to boosters, um, here in the United States, uh, the CDC rec uh, uh, evidence suggests or data suggests that only about half of fully vaccinated adults, those who've received two doses of an mRNA or single dose of a J&J &J vaccine have received a booster dose. Very recent uh, poll by Kaiser Family Foundation su suggests that about 70% of those who are eligible in the United States who have received a booster dose have, so that's encouraging. We still have a large proportion of unvaccinated people, about 20% of the U.S. population. It's very likely that many of those have already been infected. I think the big news about boosters, um, one, we're beginning to see uh, real world data about the effectiveness of a, a booster dose, particularly against the Omicron variant. Uh, within this past week, uh, the CDC released data from three large studies, um, and they suggest kind of what we might uh, expect, that there's better protection against hospitalization um, than against infection, but that that third dose of an mRNA vac vaccine really improves uh, the effectiveness. Um, the numbers vary by study, but just kind of briefly, you know, that booster dose, 90% effective against preventing hospitalizations compared to about 60% effectiveness with two doses. Uh, that's for hospitalization. Uh, for emergency room visits, about 82% uh, effective, uh, three doses, uh, with three doses, um, but with two doses, only 38%. And then lastly, a study suggesting that those who've had a booster dose are twice, uh, have twice the level of protection uh, against infection. So we see this gradient that we've seen all along. The vaccines do better at preventing more severe disease than infection. We see this other phenomenon where the, the current vaccines are less effective with Omicron than against earlier variants. Um, and that's really for three primary reasons. One is that the uh, the levels of antibody with these mRNA vaccines de and the adenovirus vector vaccines decrease over time. Uh, the Omicron variant, because of all those mutations in the spike protein, uh, requires higher levels of neutralizing antibodies. And then we see that we know that these booster doses um, increase substantially the levels of neutralizing antibodies. So that's why they're, they're, they're able to be more effective uh, against hospitalizations, emergency room visits, and infections. What we don't know yet uh, Laney, is how durable uh, the, that immunity is going to be following a booster dose. And that's going to be a key question going forward. And, and I will say in, in some honesty, you know, that's been one of the disappointments, I think. Um, these are fantastic vaccines, but uh, with, the, with the waning antibody levels and then the new variants, they have not sustained as high a level protection, particularly uh, of protection, particularly against infection uh, going forward. We also have new data from the CDC this, this week on immunocompromised people. There are about 7 million immunocompromised individuals uh, here in the United States. Um, and we see the same thing, the same pattern playing out, that third dose, uh, which we consider actually part of their primary series in this population, offering uh, you know, higher levels of protection against hospitalization. Now, you asked about Omicron-specific boosters, but there's been a lot of buzz around that. Um, Pfizer has begun their clinical trial, um, and Moderna is in, in their uh, phase two trial. So uh, Johnson & Johnson has plans to develop uh, an Omicron-specific booster. So these vaccines are in the works. They're entering uh, clinical trials, but we probably won't see uh, the see either authorizations or approvals and these rolling into arms, at least for, I think, a couple other months, uh, a, a, a couple months from now. And, you know, many people have raised the question, you know, will there still be a need for Omicron specific boosters at that time? Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, the the big wave of Omicron will likely be over uh, here in the United States, at least. And I one of the thing lessons I take from that is 
we, I, I always point out that one of the benefits of these new technologies is the ability to adapt them to a new variant. But when you have a highly transmissible, transmissible variant such as Omicron that goes through so quickly, even the, the, uh, the ease with which we can uh, modify these vaccines is really not enough uh, to keep up with, with these variants. Um, so we'll have to see whether there's uh, an important role for these. I think certainly the, the public health impact uh, is less than if we had an Omicron specific booster at the start. And I just wanna emphasize our current vaccines are still doing a really good job at protecting against severe disease. The last thing I'll say, Lainey, is that there's also been some recent buzz about pan-coronavirus vaccines. Obviously, if we had a pan-coronavirus vaccine, we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't be continually playing catch up with variants. And, and, uh, and there's a long history of this. We've been thinking about universal influenza vaccines, so we don't have to adapt that every year. There's been a lot of work over many years of a universal vaccine against HIV. Um, but this, this too is still quite a ways away. This is on the order of years away, I think, before we'll really see uh, potentially, if it's even possible, a pan-coronavirus vaccine. So I'll stop there, Lainey. Thanks so much, Bill. I'm now going to turn to questions for the three of you. Lots of questions coming in today. And this first one, Beth, is for you. And it concerns the hospitalization data that we're seeing. And I'm, I'm going to put together um, the, the common theme of several questions that have come in. So the, the gist is, are we able to distinguish in the data those who have been admitted to a hospital for a COVID-19 infection versus those who were admitted to a hospital and also have COVID? It's a, it's a great question. And unfortunately, I don't think that I'm going to be able to bring a ton of clarity to the answer. But what we, we can say is that for the majority of the data that we're seeing in the hospitalization data, those are people who are being treated for COVID-related illness. Um, and that's the data that we're seeing. And we feel very confident um, on the hospitalization data as a reflection of those folks that have come into the emergency department or been admitted um, through other mechanisms because they have COVID and they're dealing with a COVID-related illness. Um, we are learning anecdotally and um, we're hearing in a lot of conversations with state data folks that um, there's also a growing concern that a lot of people are showing up for routine surgeries or for other, out, um, other um, inpatient activities within the hospital and they are then being tested um, as, a, as a preliminary sort of intake measure and they are testing positive. Um, some of that's going to be captured in the hospitalization data, but right now the prevailing theory is that the data that we're seeing from HHS um, is squarely those folks that are seeking care because of COVID-related illness um, or illnesses that have been exacerbated because of COVID infection. Thanks very much, Beth. Jennifer, question for you that picks up on something that, that you mentioned about where we are in the, the pandemic now versus a year ago. So some have been saying that this January now will be the deadliest month in the entire trajectory of the pandemic. Can you speak to that? Yes. I mean, we are seeing um, extraordinary uh, numbers of deaths that have accumulated, you know, over the past year and since the um since the offering of vaccine. Um, when we are able to stratify the deaths by vaccination status, we see two totally different pictures where people who are vaccinated are far, far, far less likely to be counted among the deaths um, than people who are not. Um, with Omicron, uh, we have seen such extraordinarily high case numbers that even if on a per case basis, the likelihood of getting severe illness and winding up dying from that illness is lower. When you add up that smaller percentage by a lot of cases, um, it winds up being a, a lot of deaths. And so that's why, um, you know, there has been so much concern that uh, in maybe pushback against the narrative of Omicron um, being milder. There is, of course, also the, the challenge of um, healthcare and how stressed healthcare has been during this time, you know, where uh, we are seeing essentially a flash flood of cases. And that has uh, tolls um, beyond just the uh, ability to care for those cases and the ab ability to deliver quality care to a very large number of pa 
uh, patients uh, seeking care at the exact same time, but also the ability to provide care for all sorts of other uh, illnesses and conditions, the abilities to have those illnesses and conditions diagnosed, et cetera. So um, these circumstances that we've been in are by no means um, insignificant, even if um, we may have gotten some benefit from having a virus that um, doesn't tend to cause as much severe illness um, as we have seen with earlier forms. Thanks, Jennifer. Bill, question for you about the likely time frame for booster approval for kids that are in the 5 to 11 age range. Yes, um, I, I think there will be uh, uh, perhaps more vigorous discussion about this um, uh, within the FDA's advisory committee and, this, and the ACIP's advisory committee. Um, I just saw a report, Laney, today that Sweden has decided not rec to recommend uh, COVID-19 vaccines in the 5 to 11-year-old age group. Um, so I imagine we'll see in the next month or two uh, at least this issue raised um, with the FDA and, and, this, and the CDC and their advisory committees. Um, I don't want to try to uh, try to prejudge my well. My inclination is that they will authorize uh, booster doses in that age group, um, but I, I think we will see more of a, of a debate around this, and it, it, it has to do with the fact of weighing, you know, uh, potential risks and, and potential benefits in younger and younger age groups uh, going forward. Thanks, Bill. And I'll give you a, a quick piggyback question, which is any thoughts about um, COVID vaccines for the youngest children? Yeah. And several questions coming, coming in today from parents of very young children, meaning under five years old. Right. So um, just to summarize kind of where we are on that, Pfizer, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is kind of leading the pack again in terms of uh, gathering data on their vaccine in the uh, children six months to five years of age. Uh, they decided in their clinical trial to use a, a much smaller dose based on evidence that they had gathered. So that's a, a, a three microgram dose compared to the 30 micrograms that are given to adults. And what they found in, in their early studies is that the, the immunogenicity, the levels of antibodies with that smaller dose of the vaccine um, uh, were lower than uh, in a comparable or, or to comp when compared to uh, individuals 16 to 25 years of age. So they felt that uh, the antibody responses they were getting in that age group, the two to five year age group, uh, was insufficient. And what Pfizer has decided to do uh, in their trial is to offer a third dose, uh, make it a three dose series, that third dose two months after the second dose, um, rather than go back and start the trial again with a slightly higher dose of the vaccine. Um, and so that will delay, um, cause delays in, in terms of accumulating the trial data. So um, I, I'm expecting that we'll see uh, that come to the FDA and the ACIP and CDC probably the second quarter of this year. Great. Thanks so much, Bill. And you will get the last word for today because we are right at 1230. So I'd like to thank Beth Flower, Bill Moss, and Jennifer Nelso for joining me and give a big thank you to everyone who joined us and especially to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. This briefing will be archived and available on coronavirus.jhu.edu. And as a reminder, we will continue to offer these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays this year. Our next briefing will be on Friday, February 11th at noon. I look forward to seeing you next month. Until then, thanks and stay safe. <laughs>